How you doing? All right. Down in the trove, just me and my baby. We're all going crazy, but jumping and having fun. Yeah, all right, that's the last time I go behind Glenn David Andrews. <laughs> if you look in your programs, you saw Howard Shearer was supposed to be before me, and he was going after uh, Glenn David Andrews. But he's been in the business longer than me, and he knew I'm not going to make that mistake. <laughs> so they left that stupid ass shit to me. <laughs> So here I am, Wendell Pierce, born and raised right here in New Orleans. I am from a little neighborhood out east in Gentilly in the Ninth Ward called Pontchartrain Park. If you haven't been there, you should visit sometime this weekend. Most of the people, if you're from New Orleans, say yeah. yeah. If you're from someplace else, say, someplace else, say yeah. yeah. All right, God, we got people from here and there. So it's a little neighborhood called Puncher Train Park. I was born and raised there. It was a neighborhood that was created in the early 1950s. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that, but first, it's crisis and creativity. Crisis and creativity. And how that affects me. This little kid I still see myself as, born and raised in New Orleans from Puncher Train Park. Citizen and artist. For those of you who don't know, I am an actor. I was born here, but I studied here at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts. Yes. One of the finest arts institutions in the world. Exhibited by the plethora of talent that came out in the 80s in music and the plethora of talent that's coming out in visual arts now in the beginning of the 21st century. I then went to Juilliard and studied classical theater. <laughs> and this is my Second microphone. <laughs> that is still not working. <laughs> but I'm an actor, and this is a stage. You can hear it. <laughs> Crisis and creativity, the ability to improvise. <laughs> Crisis and creativity. We're all here on a roller coaster ride. I don't know about you, but emotionally, I've been up and down. Up and down this week and on this weekend. And as I try to get to that place that Glenn took us to just a minute ago, I must admit I'm having difficulty because I think of those thousands of people who lost their lives. And we should never forget that. As we even say, we're looking forward and moving forward and looking to. <laughs> looking forward to whatever may happen. forward to, but sometimes <laughs> it's great to look back also. <laughs> First Glenn and now this fine woman right here. Thank you very much. <laughs> and with that, thank you. <laughs> ah, there it is. <laughs> I may put it wherever I may. Want to. Never say that to me. <laughs> so where was I? Crisis and creativity, thinking forward. <laughs> but never forgetting to look back. Let's never forget our family and friends and neighbors and New Orleanians who didn't make it past this weekend five years ago. We must never forget them. And for those who say, oh, let's just forget that and move on, they're revisionist history, historians. They're people who are in denial. We should never forget them, even as we look forward. The two can coexist. Crisis and creativity. You know, as an actor right now, it's art imitating life and life imitating art. First, it started a couple of years ago when I did Godot, Waiting for Godot in New York, first at the, theater of, uh, uh, the Classical Theater of Harlem. It was in response to the storm, to the crisis. And then I came here and did it on the hallowed ground of the Ninth Ward and in Gentilly, waiting for Godot in that vast wasteline, waiting for Godot who never came. 
and was a moment for all of us collectively to think back to that moment when they didn't come, when they didn't come. But we all wanted to, and they stopped us at the borders. That's the one thing that, for you, those of you from other places, always know this. As we evacuated, we were listening on our transistor radios, and we knew what was happening in the city. We couldn't see it. We were out of power in the different places we had evacuated to. But people forgot that when we heard it, we did our own Dunkirk run. Remember that, folks? We got in our cars and said, I can pick up somebody at the convention center. I'll grab somebody at the Superdome. And we were stopped from coming back into the city. Let's not forget that also. We didn't abandon our neighbors in their darkest hour. We were abandoned in our darkest hour. Crisis and creativity. So as I responded to the crisis as an artist, I knew that Godot had its impact and made us think about who we are. I did Treme, and I'm doing Treme now, which is gives us a time to sit back on a Sunday evening as a city and as New Orleanians around the world and take a breath and reflect on who we are. That's the role of art in our society. We forget that. That's why I became an, an actor. What thoughts are to the individual, art is and culture is to the community as a whole. It's the place where we think on where we've been, who we are, where we hope to go, our inadequacies and our strengths. What those thoughts are to the individual who lies awake at night in bed and looks up at the ceiling, wondering, what kind of man am I? The forum of culture is where we as a community think about what kind of people are we? And to have that moment on a Sunday afternoon or evening, whether you like the show or not, means that you're taking that moment and indulging in the greatest access to what humanity is, and that's a community dealing with its culture. The intersection of life and a people coming together. Culture, that's what it is. Crisis and creativity. That was the creative response to this crisis. My creative response to the crisis. But we, almost, we always have to remember what the crisis is. That punch five years ago and that second five months ago. A crisis pre-Katrina and a crisis post-Katrina. We must not, in this fervor, to rebuild and look on anew, look through rose-colored glasses. Let's not forget that. Let's be true to ourselves. I lost my glasses, by the way. That's why I have these sunshades on. I'm not that pretentious. <laughs> these are my only prescription glasses today, so forgive me. We must not forget the dysfunction of our government, then or now. We have $3 billion still sitting in the coffers of the state because there are those who don't want us to use it to rebuild. I was in meetings today, banging on the desk, asking, please bring it to our program so people can come home. We must not forget, and we all know about this, the dysfunction of education prior to the storm and the fear of the dysfunction that it could be after. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry has a charter school nowadays, right? There's a, there's, a radio, there's a radio ad that is so disturbing to me. This guy says, he has his charter school, and he goes, you know, come, it's from kindergarten to sixth grade. I'm like, kindergarten? <laughs> kindergarten? I'm going to send my kid to a school where the principal is saying, welcome to kindergarten. <laughs> How the hell did he get a charter school? There's going to be that dysfunction then as now. So let's not look through rose-colored glasses, be true to ourselves. And there's also the dysfunction of cu culture. We even had a line on Treme where they said, man, people in New Orleans love New Orleans music, but they really don't treat New Orleans musicians that well. That's a dysfunction. That's a dysfunction that right now, if you go to South Perdido and Rampart, stands hallowed ground for New Orleans jazz. Oddfellows Hall on the Register of National Historic Places 
where Buddy Bolden played so loud, where the myth began, and Kid Ori played with Lil Louis Armstrong looking through the door, figuring out how he can become a master. It sits derelict in a city that says they love their culture. We have dysfunction in our culture. Let's not forget that as we move forward. Let's not look through rose-colored glasses. We are complex. These are complex issues, so don't try to solve them simplistically. There's that irony, that irony that I was just talking about all around us, where there's a tale of two cities. There, have been, uh, there has been an, uh, uh, an abject, um, what's the word that I wanted? I, I couldn't write it down. I couldn't figure it out. The way we've dealt with the poor in this city, having an understanding of we want to change it, but let's just sweep it under the rug almost. If we just make it so difficult for folks to come back, then we won't see it. It's almost, it's intentional for some. But for most of us, it's not. There but by the grace of God go I. So our dysfunction of dealing with the poor and the class issues that we have here, those are challenges that are complex. But as we move forward, let's not look through rose-colored glasses. Five years of progress, but we have many more years to come. So how did I deal with crisis? and creativity. Creatively, as an actor, I understood what to do. But then as a citizen, what is there to do? I realized three things. One, we are demonstrating to the world a display of the American aesthetic of the ingenuity and resilience of the New Orleans people that hasn't been on display in a generation. We are showing the nation and the world that in spite of what is happening to us, we are stepping up to the plate and showing our true character and who we are as a people because we will not be defeated. No matter how many news stories try to tell us that we are down and depressed, we are not demoralized. We are being champions and we are on display and showing the world that. Secondly, the contributions that we are making to the change of this world is because we're taking the step of being able to look at ourselves and deal with our dysfunctions. That's the true heroic step, to be able to understand what is my complicity in this as an individual and a community. What is my contribution to this dysfunctional paradigm, this dysfunctional, uh, 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 th dysfunctional world that was created prior to the crisis and may still go on? What is my contribution to the dynamic and how can I change it? People are demonstrating that all across this city. And so as a citizen and not an artist, I had a response, not an artistic creative response, but a civic creativity to the response of what was happening in New Orleans. And that was Punch Train Park. I knew that this neighborhood that was built in the 1950s, when blacks couldn't go to the parks except on one day, Negro Day, I thought it was just in hairspray, but that shit was real. <laughs> Negro Day was on Wednesdays in New, in New Orleans. And that was the only time my parents could actually go to a park. It was A.P. Turo who led the civil rights movement to say, we need access to our parks and recreational areas. He led the civil rights movement that led to Puncher Train Park. It was a time when they said, let's appease this movement with putting 1,000 homes around this golf course, designed by Joseph Bartholomew, who designed most of the courses in New Orleans, but couldn't play on them because he was African American. We took something that was ugly and turned it into something beautiful. Let that be a template, a model for what we are doing now, taking something that is ugly and turning it into something beautiful, Ta taking something that is dysfunctional and turning it into that city and community that we know we all want, that we have common ground, yes, common ground, <laughs> right? Common ground and consensus about the city that we envision. And there was a day just a few weeks ago, a few months ago, when we opened our first homes in Punch Train Park. I wanted to bring back the community in a way in the 21st century where it was gonna be 
uh, economically accessible and environmentally uh, superb. So solar and geothermal homes are going up in Pontchartrain Park. That's what we re we, we're rebuilding. It was a dream that came to me as a response to Katrina. And I shared that dream with the members of my community. It was a dream that came to me but was shared by many others, some of whom uh, had the money and some who didn't, some of whom offered encouragement and some who, who, uh, who joined our effort. And then we came to a point where we opened that first home, and that was a major accomplishment. And like first accomplishments, it's the result of many previous steps that we made. I reached out to past and present residents who shared that dream with me, and we knew that we could do it. And we did it. So now Pontchartrain Park is coming back with solar and geothermal homes in the 21st century and being rebuilt the way my parents created it and their generation created it in the 1950s. The Moses generation that led us to that place handed a legacy to us, the Joshua generation, who have to step up and keep it going and create the New Orleans that we know is out there in vision but can be there in practicality. Thank you for listening. Glenn David, I will never follow you again. <laughs>